Welcome, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. My name is Debbie Fink, and I am the Director of Community Outreach and Impact for Respectability. Respectability is a national, nonpartisan nonprofit that advocates on behalf of all people with disabilities, both visible and non-visible disabilities. We do this by fighting stigma and advancing opportunities. <clears throat> on behalf of respectability, I'd like to welcome each and every one of you, those here physically with us and those here virtually via the webinar and via the live stream on Facebook, um, to our empowerment training for female college students with disabilities and their allies. This is the fifth of six trainings in our Women's Disability Leadership, Inclusion, and Advocacy Series. Um, we need somebody on the PowerPoint. Chris? Okay. Chris? All right. So if we could advance the slides, please. Um, so we're so pleased to get started. As a warm-up, I want to conduct some participatory action research with you. It's voluntary to participate, and it's fun to look around and get a sense for the makeup of the other participants. On the topic of participation, both for the research and throughout the afternoon, both, in both cases, our invitation to you is to participate at any level which, that you are comfortable with. Okay, we got that? So back to the research at hand. Please raise your hand to the following questions. How many here are students at Gutman Community College? Okay. How many are CUNY, CUNY students? All right. We have a few. Um, Hunter College? Okay. Um, Stony Brook University? Great. Marymount College? All right. Anyone want to call out another school? Did I say NYU? NYU! Woo woo! <laughs> All right, did I, any other schools here present? Fordham. Fordham! Let's hear it for Fordham. Wow, great showing. Yay. All right, any other schools? Okay, so I also want to give a shout out to those students and professor from Cochise College in Arizona and the self-advocates from Utah State University who have tuned into our webinar. Welcome to all. For those present at any time during the training, feel free to wander over to our self-expression graffiti wall, which is looking really blank right now, to write or draw your disabilities on one side and your abilities on the other side. We have color markers. Make it really colorful. And then at the end, we're going to do something really cool with it. All right, and you can feel free to get them move around any at any time. Also, if um, the sound, if, if there's any sound that um, is bothersome to you, let me know, and I have in my pocket some earplugs if you want to mute some of the sound. So, to each one listening, I want to open up with a motivational quote by Golda Meir. These 35 wise, wise words are what today's empowerment training is all about. Trust yourself. <coughs> Create the kind of self that you will be happy to live with all your life. Make the most of yourself by fanning the tiny inner sparks of possibility into flames of achievement. Translating this quote into deliverable tools here are to, uh, today, these are the tools that we hope to deliver to you to take charge self-advocating on and beyond campus, to take charge self-advocating socially, to take action advocating for yourself and others on and beyond campus, and to meet other students on a similar journey and cultivate new relationships. Next slide. Moving right along, as you see in this disclaimer, we understand that when it comes to disability advocacy, Folks have and should have strong ideas and opinions. Hence, we want to clarify that everyone here today is exercising free speech, one of our great freedoms in this country, 
and that their views solely represent their own views. I also want to make sure to thank our very generous hosts here today at Gutman Community College, which does a remarkable job supporting its students with disabilities. Thanks to the other schools that shared the information about this training, and thanks a big thanks goes to the New York Women's Foundation and the Coca-Cola Foundation for their direct support of this effort. It is now my pleasure to pass the mic to Barbara Bookman, who is CUNY's University Director of Disability Programs. Before I say another word about her, please make sure to silence your cell phones. Um, thanks. It is such a privilege to have Barbara here with us today and we'd like to welcome you with a round of applause. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much. It's so great to be here. Um, I just want to add one question to the particip participatory part. How many, anyone here a graduate of CUNY or oh, did attend okay. CUNY at any point? My hand goes up too. Yeah. Okay. All right. Nice to hear. I stand before you as a Queens College graduate from what? Yeah, okay. And from the year 19, I'm not telling, right? Long time ago, all right? So, so we have students. How many people here are considering going to college? Not quite there yet. Anybody? Okay, wonderful, wonderful. So by way of introduction, um, since this isn't really a CUNY room, um, <laughs> I am Barbara Bookman. I'm the University Director of Disability Programs at CUNY. We proudly uh, serve over 11,000 students with disabilities at the university. So that basically goes to say if you're a person with a disability, visible, invisible, whatever it may be, uh, there's a place for you. And it's not just CUNY. I would say it's, you know, it's colleges and the world of work out there. So. Um, I, I want to say what's re it's really great to be here. This is an amazing event. There's a lot of, I could see already from the room, a lot of dynamic and visionary women who are using your intelligence and your cre creativity to really move the dial um, for women with disabilities at what we call the CUNYverse and also beyond. Okay, and I know there are some terrific men in the room here too. It's not only women. Um, in fact, it was Chris Robinson who introduced me to Debbie. So, Thank you, Chris. okay, so um, there are some wonderful guys here as well. And also, I think the timing of this event that it's really the junction of Women's History Month and CUNY Disability Awareness Month. So it's a well-timed event. Um, and also, just talking for a minute about CUNY, um, we've been a leader in the area of diversity, really since 1847. Our first inaugural class was 143 men, but 20 years later, the women came on in, and that really was the beginning of our diversity that just kept growing and growing and growing, and now I'd say we have 56% of our students are female, and a lot of veterans. So I would say we at CUNY and whatever school you're in and just the world in general, we've really come a long way over the years. It's forums like this where we can come together, we celebrate our accomplishments, and we continue um, to be strong self-advocates. But if you want to look at some of the statistics, we really show that only about 14% of people with disabilities uh, achieve a BA, all right? That's not a high, it compares to about 37% of people without disabilities over the course of the country. Um, if you look just at New York, some statistics for women, with some college, 37% um, of women are employed and 52% of women <coughs> today are working. And that doesn't even always say fully employed. Some people are underemployed. They may be part-time. They want to be full-time. They may not be in their field. So we do still have work to do. But with where we're going and what we're doing, I'd say we are really moving the dial forward. So this is great. Um, we come together. We're preparing ourselves to show the world that there's no stopping us. We're women of strength, power, resourcefulness. And on that, I want to wish you all a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. That was so inspiring. We really appreciate it. And thank you, 
On behalf of all the students in the CUNY system with disabilities, we thank you for all the work that you do. We to love them all. <laughs> so uh, now we begin our panel, self, uh, self advocacy on and beyond campus. I have the pleasure of introducing today's moderator, Gabby Einstein Sim, who is both a cherished respectability board member and a graduate student here in New York City studying community health education at Columbia's Teacher College. Isn't it Teacher's College? Isn't that where you went, Barbara? I went to Teacher's There you go. All right. And <laughs> Gabby is graduating next month. Oh, Woo! Yeah. 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 Thank you for taking the time away from your exams and your papers to be here today. Um, I also want to welcome and thank Dr. D. Soder and her dear, dear service dog, Envy. Um, and and Bar Dr. D. Soder is another valued board member of ours who has joined us today. Raise your hand, D. There you go. Um, and we want to thank you for coming. D will be taking. Uh, notes and observing to help us better our best practices by um, providing me with feedback afterwards. So welcome and thank you, Dee and Andy. Um, so now, Gabby, it's all yours. Thank and you, Debbie. You're welcome. So we will make way for our speakers. And um, one moment of transition. And speak loudly for the for the um, sake of the webinar. <laughs> Yes. Okay, is this good? Yeah. Louder? I think you're over. Okay. Okay, here, quick. Okay, well, thank you, Debbie. And once again, welcome, everyone. We're so happy to see you all today. And um, I'd like to thank our panelists for being here as well. We're excited to hear what you have to say. So I'm going to turn to each of you and have you start your time by answering the very simple but very complex question, what does self-advocacy mean to you? So we're going to start with Crystal. Crystal's on the end there, and thank you for joining us today. And, but really, we are all joining you. Thank you for inviting us to join you here. Um, you've been so graciously hosting us and so helpful. Five out of six of our trainings have been here, and it's just been wonderful working with you and Gutman. Um, and so, oh, Crystal is a CUNY alum and the Associate Director of Accessibility Services and the Women's Resource Services Specialist here at Gutman Community College. Please share your story and how self-advocacy plays out when it comes to academics and curricular advocacy. Hi, everyone. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Sure. So, um, let me just share just a little bit about my disability. I have lupus with called me to have chronic kidney disease and also um, be on a machine for four and a half hours to cleanse the system of my body. So um, when entering John Jay College where I attend, I didn't know that there was a disability services office. And my first semester was extremely difficult in terms of managing going to school full time, working part time along with tests and exams and so on and so forth. Um, I met this special dean of mine who um, actually assisted me in terms of becoming a better self-advocate. So my three points with becoming a self-advocate is one, know yourself. Be comfortable with your disability. Understand that your limitations are not limitations. It's just strategies that you have to implement in order to receive what you need within the classroom or without the classroom. Um, I don't know. Oh, as soon as you want. Um, also, the, the nine minutes. Okay. Also, to understand that you know, although you're within the Office of Accessibility Service, it doesn't mean that you're you're stigmatized in having a disability. You're just using the support services. So many of the offices within CUNY have changed their name to Accessibility or um, disability services uh, with the notion of support services. So I hope everyone in this room understands like accessibility is like the wave to go. Thank you, Crystal. Really appreciate you sharing such a personal story and it's great to see how self-advocacy is a journey that you started from, you know, not even knowing about the office and now you 
work in it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you. We're going to now move right along to Rebecca Gross. So Rebecca, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. You started out as a volunteer with respectability and are now working for us part time as our inclusionist here in the city. You've had a lot of experience doing a grassroots organization when you were at Sarah Lawrence College. Can you please share your story as a self-advocate and your insight when it comes to campus-wide advocacy for all students and, of course, faculty and staff as well with disabilities? Sure. So, hi. Like Gabby said, my name is Rebecca Gross. Um, a little bit about me. I, uh, I have a number of learning disabilities, and when I was younger, I went to a couple of different Jewish day schools that did not know how to support my learning needs, and that was very difficult. I didn't, to the best of my, you know, little kindergarten through third grade mind self, I had no idea if there were other students with disabilities around me. I didn't really understand what that meant, and that was really difficult. Um, I, I moved schools a couple of times. By the time that I was in middle school, partially because of this, I was also dealing a lot with um, un untreated mental health issues that were also making it much harder to learn and be successful in school. Um, when I went into eighth grade, I finally got transferred to a school specifically for students with learning disabilities here in the city. And when I was there, I was finally able to learn and understand that I am a smart person who has things to contribute. Um, that I'm kind of breezing along because I want to cover a lot, but um, so hooray. Um, <laughs> but the even though I was in a school for students with disabilities, I and I had a lot of friends there. I didn't really feel that I had a community of people with disabilities around me. Everyone around me had a disability, but that's not really anything. There wasn't really any talk about how that disability helped define us as people. Um, so when I ended up starting at Sarah Lawrence College as a first year, and I found that there was a group called the Sarah Lawrence College Disability Alliance, or SLICTA for short, I was really, really excited and it made a really big impact on me because I realized that there were people uh, on campus, even though this wasn't a special ed school, that, I, that their disability was a part of their identity. Um, I was a part of the group for the first year and then for my first year and then for my following three years I was one of the co-chairs of the, of the group and I was really fortunate to work with some really great people and we led a number of I would say pretty successful events uh, throughout my, my tenure I suppose uh, working as the co-chair of this um, excuse me of this group and so based on what I've learned from that, I wanted to share sort of what I found helpful when I was planning a number of events, even if it was a number of events at the same time, I wanted to share some things that I found helpful to think about while I was planning these events that we can talk more about in the small group discussions later. Uh, next slide, please. So when you are planning events for disability rights for disability access on campus or anywhere else, I found it really helpful to think about the different groups of people that you were trying to address, that you were trying to reach. So for me, that meant the three groups of people, how I thought of it that was most helpful for me was disabled students. And for disabled students, it's really important, like I found in my first year, to create an actual community space that meets at a regular amount of time at a, for, uh, sorry, at a regular time each week so that you can have that community and share experiences with people who might also ha be experiencing similar things. Um, on top of that, the, uh, the next group is allies or future allies, uh, which are students without disabilities, so your, your fellow students. And most people who don't have disabilities, especially at, you know, my young age don't necessarily know a lot about it. So the most important thing that you can do in that case is create fun events that they want to come to that are educational and help create allies in the non-disabled 
uh, part of the, of the student community. The third group, of course, is faculty and staff, who are the people that you have to talk to about more specific access needs. If there's something blocking the accessible entrance to a building, if there's a professor who's refusing to put captions in the bottom of a movie for some reason, or anything like that, in that, when you're talking with professors, you really need to, or with administration, it's not as important to educate them about the wider issues as it is to explain the specific things that you need and what they need to do in order to achieve those things. Um, not every event that you hold needs to reach all three of these groups, but I found it very helpful while I was planning events throughout a whole year to make sure kind of in my head picking off, okay, the last two events that I had didn't really address what the faculty should be doing. So maybe the next event that I have should touch on that. The last event that I had was really only for talking to the faculty, so the next one should really be about building community for my fellow students with disabilities, and so on and so forth. Um, the other thing within that is that, in my opinion, all advocacy should do two things. One thing, one or both of these two things, excuse me. One thing is to increase awareness of a community, and that could include within the community itself, so like me learning more about the disability community from people who are in different parts of the disability community, and also to the, and also, excuse me, sorry, and also reaching out to the non-disabled community. And then the second thing is having specific goals. I found in my time leading this group that if I went to try and accomplish something and my list was 50 things long and none of them were super well explained, I didn't get a lot done. My most successful events were focusing on one or two things that could be written in one page even and that could be easily understood. Um, so I'm coming towards the end of my time, so could I have the next slide please? Uh, the one thing I want to leave you with is that student advocacy for all different groups of marginalized identities, including disability, are really important and not only on a campus level. A lot of the most important and most influential advocacy, uh, disability advocacy started out on campus. I don't have time to go into them, but I have these images up here to show you as an image description. One of them is a black and white image of a man named Ed Roberts, who was an amazing, um, he started as a self-advocate at UC Berkeley. He started a group uh, in the 60s, before there were really any people in wheelchairs in colleges, he started a group called the Rolling Quads, which was a group of students with disabilities who really paved the way for, um, well, future students with disabilities. So I encourage you to look up the Rolling Quads, UC Berkeley, later on when you have some time. And then the other thing that I'd encourage you to look up is the Deaf President Now protest from Gallaudet University in 1988 which is a really, really strong example of, of um, we'll talk. So I was there. <laughs> we'll talk. Mm -hmm. um, but it, which is a really strong example of students, of whether you're identifying as um, deaf or as disabled or as a combination, students having very specific set goals. They had, I believe, four goals listing them very carefully, being very motivated and organized in those, pro in those protests and getting what they needed to happen, which in this case was having a deaf president represent the deaf university. Um, so I'd encourage you to look up deaf president. Now, the rolling quads, it's, they're really some inspi inspiring stories for self-advocacy and for advocating for your community. Um, and never underestimate the power that you have starting small and growing from there. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. That was very motivating. It's great to hear how you progressed throughout college and everything that you did. And you are very right that students could and should be heard and that a respectful United Front is the most effective way to go about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also really
really appreciate you pointing out the three subgroup populations that can be affected by campus disability advocacy and be benefited by it. There's the students, there's the allies. Oh, sorry. I'm trying to get back to the timer. I'm sorry. <laughs> and the school staff and faculty. Uh, I think that a lot of us probably look forward to when we are in the smaller groups and getting some more information from you about actionable things we can do, some hands-on how-to stuff. So thank you. Okay, so moving on to Brylin. Brylin is a former fellow of respectability. About that. Yeah, you'll hear more about that soon. We're accepting applications. Um, <laughs> and she has quite a story to set tell, and I'm just going to let her speak. And yeah, go ahead. Great. It's already on. Okay, it's already on. Hi, guys. Uh, my name is Brylin Rake. I was born and raised in California, and then I went to Fordham University, the Lincoln Center campus. Uh, double majored in communications and media studies and dance, so my entire life I was in the tutu, um, competing and dancing my way through elementary school, middle school, high school. I wanted to be a ballerina my whole life, and so I went to college for that in New York. But one of my dreams as well is to go to college in New York. Um, and so I just, I just graduated from, from there in 2017. And right after that, I went to Washington, D.C. to do a communications fellowship at Respectability. And this was a really important point for me because all I had done was dance. I had my second major, which was just kind of a backup plan, but all I did was dance, and then I was put into this nonprofit environment, and I was at a desk, I was in my business attire, it was amazing. We were doing so much good work for people with disabilities. Um, and so I kind of realized that summer, summer of 2017, that maybe dance wasn't what I was going to do long term. Maybe there was more that I could offer. So um, thank you, Respectability, for kind of opening my eyes to the fact that I can do whatever I want to do. Even I knew I could have definitely become a professional dancer. I had the ambition and the talent, but uh, my heart just wasn't in it anymore. And so something that is really prevalent with me right now is understanding that it's okay to change directions. And you mentioned it, starting small and building up from there is something that I'm doing personally right now. So currently, I'm at the Community College of Rhode Island taking business classes because, again, I had never done anything else except for communications and dance. So I'm setting the stage for um, a master's degree in business. I have no idea where I'm going to go yet, but also, I'm involved in extracurriculars at the community college. I'm part of a club called DECA, and I'm really close with the advisor for that club, and she wants me to be the incoming president of the club next semester, so that's amazing. I'm laying the groundwork for business school, and that's kind of what is really like relevant in my life right now is that I'm setting the stage for business school. Um, also, a little segue, I have a visual impairment, so I have what's called achromatopsia, so that includes nystagmus, uh, full color blindness. Um, I'm considered legally blind, and I have a type of cone dystrophy, which means my eyes are very sensitive to light. So that's just a little snippet about my disability. And um, we're, we're going to try to show your video, which may. Yes, so there's a... It's a silent movie. Yeah, I'm going to moderate while we show a really special video. Um, when I was a senior in high school, I was asked to perform on ABC's Dancing with the Stars. And we are going to... Yeah, let's get the lights. Should we move off and to the side? Yeah, let's move to the side. There's something going on with the sound. So, Brylin is going to show the video and then we're going to moderate... Um, and you'll have to hear the music in your own ears. So feel free to. Um, I'm interested to see how this how it's going to sound. We'll see. <laughs> okay, so we don't have much sound. So this is the heart of the show, and he is introducing me. Um, so what happened was I was auditioning for Juilliard in at the end of my high school experience. It was my dream school. I got to the end of the 
like the audition process. It started it with 100 people, ended in like six, and then they cut me. I was devastated. A couple hours later, I get a call from the producers of Dancing with the Stars asking if they could do a special segment on me. It's called the AT&T Spotlight Performance. And so, oh, that's my dad, Michael Rakes. He actually passed away a couple of days after this uh, aired. Um, haven't seen him. I, I usually try to see him when I watch this video. So, um, so right here, I'm just kind of talking about my visual impairment, which I just explained to you. Um, and here I am expressing myself. And <laughs> essentially, I've never moderated to a group of people. Um, he's explaining that <coughs> you can't really tell that I have a disability, but but it's there. And I um, I was also explaining how I'm very light sensitive. And I use like enlarged print on an iPad and used a lot of resources. And I loved my Office of Disability Services at Fordham. Thank goodness for them. Um, they helped provide me with all of these tools. Um, I also use audiobooks, Learning Ally. I'm also a Learning Ally mentor. So, um, and now this video is going into how I love dance so much and I never wanted to stop despite having my visual impairment. This is me in class. That little tiny hop was not supposed to be there, but nobody <laughs> noticed that. <laughs> Except my mom was like, was that hop supposed to be there? And I said, no, you're not supposed to know about that. Um, so there, we're still discussing my vision. And this is you know, in the rehearsal in LA. And this is Derek Huff, one of the main stars of the show, one of the main lead dancers. And they surprised me um, by letting me dance with him. I had no idea what I was going to be doing on the show. I knew I was going to be dancing with someone, but I didn't know who or what it was going to be. This is me, really excited. Ah. Star. He got to dance with you. Right, right. Yes. He was impressed with, with my skill, and it was... The pro this whole process took like maybe two and a half hours and he canceled the next day's rehearsal because I didn't really need it, which was a compliment. Um, this floor is incredibly slippery, <laughs> uh, scary. Um, and so we are about to see the segment um, or the actual performance itself. So this is live, people. Like, I could not make a mistake or else everyone on the East Coast would see it live. <laughs> um, uh, it, it's sad that you can't hear this. It's a really beautiful song. Um, you can see everything with sound on dailymotion.com. You type in my name, Brylin Rakes, Daily Motion, and you can watch this for yourself. This whole beginning section is improvisa improvisation. Um, didn't know what it was going to be. Um, yep, here we go. Bam, okay. Uh, this is... Just a really fun piece. I loved doing it. This gave me a cramp in my leg, that move right there. <laughs> um, I really loved performing this. It was such a pleasure. Derek was really cute. He like would walk me around the set holding my hand, <coughs> making sure I didn't step on any or trip on any wires. This lift had my back really sore. Um, but I love how they did all of the different camera angles. Um, this part was kind of slippery. The whole thing was pretty slippery. I tried not to fall on my face on national television. Um, after the show, I, after this performance, I got so much feedback from people with disabilities all over the country, parents with kids with similar visual impairments to me, um, saying that my story gave them hope. So that's what kind of gave birth to my passion for disability advocacy, knowing that something like this can be on the internet and just can be spread to show people with disabilities that like you can do great things if you set your mind to it and if you have the right attitude and if you go about it in a way that works for you and if you put the time and energy and if your heart is really in it, you can really do, oh, funny thing, they thought that was my mom, that is not my mom. <laughs> my mom was like, thank goodness, they didn't actually get me on there, <laughs> which is silly. Um. So Derek, I guess, was a little choked up at this point, which is kind of funny. Um, wow. I'm not actually that thin. Yes, I think so. Oh, I was really out of breath trying to like keep it together. Oh, it's fun to, to watch this. 
I wasn't actually that tan. They put like makeup all over your whole body, which is kind of crazy. And and that's it. I would encourage you guys to go on and look at look at the video so you can hear the sound. But it was you got like an inside scoop moderating from me, so that's kind of fun. Um, <laughs> And I look forward to doing the roundtable sessions with you guys later. And if you have any questions for me, just let me know. Um, yeah, I hope we have, a, we have a great rest of the day together. Thank you. If the mom, um, yeah. Thank you. Wow, I can't believe you can move like that. <laughs> and that you went in front of all these people and did so beautifully. Wow. Thank you so much. So I hear that we may be having some movement with you later. Is this thing on? Yes, it is. <laughs> we are. Yeah, we're all going to stand up and stretch our legs and move around a little bit. And please don't be shy. There is no judgment in this room. And it's just going to be fun and feel really good. And it's going to be great. And no one's going to be no one's going to be judging you. I know it can be a little nerve wracking, but it's going to be fun. Okay. Well, we're looking forward to that. But for now, we are going to do a panel. So if there are, there are no cards on your table, if you have any questions for any of our panelists, please write them down and they will be brought up and we will try to ask as many questions as we can. But you will be seeing um, all three of them within the smaller group sessions after the panel. So I've got a starter question for each panelist. I guess I'll start. I'll start with Crystal. Crystal, what do you think was your biggest hurdle faced in owning your disability in terms of self-advocacy? Well, Crystal thinks about that. I'll be collecting the cards, so you, if you have a card for oh, me yes. right now, just raise your hand. Raise your hand. Got it. Um, my biggest hurdle was understanding my disability. I really didn't understand how it would affect me attending classes or having extra time on assignments or exams. I didn't understand um, my strengths in terms of self-advocacy and what I could have done for myself during my first semester. It took a lot of owning my disability and not looking at it as a limitation, but looking at it as a superpower or a strength. So just having conversations with faculty, the deans, um, disability services, and so on made me, you know, created a path for me of working with a lot of our students. So I'm um, actually great and, and excited to do that here. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, let's move on to Rebecca. Rebecca, what do you what can you do if there's no established disability organizations on your campus? Uh, good question. So I was lucky when I got to my campus that someone right before me had really started to develop the group. But I highly encourage anyone who wants to create a community of disabled students on their campus to research the guidelines for starting organizations. Most schools don't make it very difficult because they want to be able to tout that they have a lot of different student organizations. I know for my school, it just meant that it, you had to have like three people who signed on as being interested. Um, so I would really try to reach out to anyone who you know who either has a disability or who is a strong ally of people with disabilities. Start with the people who you know would be interested to create a core group, even if it's not official at first, you can start meeting unofficially and then grow from there. So I guess sort of the same as what I said at the end of uh, what I was saying before is start small, it counts for starting a group as well. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, just following that up, we got some questions from the audience, but I wanted to just mention that if, this qu if your question is for a specific panelist, please write down their name. I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you that earlier. Um, so this question is when and how do you disclose your disability if it's non-visible? And do any of the panelists want to, uh, we, we could ask. I can, I can comment on this and anybody like follow up with, with what I have to say. If you have a disability that's not visible uh, right away, I would, 
I would not disclo disclose it right away either. Um, don't wait too long. You really have to feel out each situation and weigh how comfortable you are with whoever you might be disclosing it to, or you just kind of have to feel out. There's not just one answer for this. It really just depends, and also learning from each time that something happens. I know for me, when I first got to Fordham, I immediately disclosed that I had a vision impairment to all the dance faculty, all of my peers, and I feel like I should have waited like maybe a month to just show them what I was capable of and to then t tell them like what was really going on because they, you can't tell right away with me that I have a disability. And so just not leading with that, leading with your abilities, <laughs> I'm playing with words here, leading with what you can offer to whatever, if it's a position, if it's like a volunteering thing or an internship, leading with what you are able to do and then follow up a little bit later with that you have a disability that maybe they didn't realize. It doesn't make sure you say, it does not hinder me. I, wor I know how to work with it. It actually sets me apart because I'm a, I have a unique perspective and um, then they're just going to have so much respect for you and what you do and it's just a, it's a really good so it's just a really good way to do it. That's just my, my take. Anybody want to add anything? Um, I will add, once you um, enter college and speak to your disability services officer, um, have a conversation and discuss with them in terms of your documentation. The first thing is to understand the documentation and what you could do within a class setting. Um, most directors have, you know, self-advocacy tips on their board or, um, a category where tips and, and strategies in terms within the classroom that could help. I personally, I waited for a semester to do it on my own. I shouldn't have done that. I should have gone to the disabilities office within at least the first two to three weeks to discuss the needs that I have, to discuss my strengths, and what strategies would have been better for me as a person having a non-disability. Uh, if I could just add one more thing, I think um, like Crystal gave a really good description of the importance of speaking with the Disability Services Office and Vera Lynn, I think you gave a really good description of sort of the nuances in when you self-disclose as someone with an invisible disability. Um, and I think one thing I want, I, I just want to add, yeah, it's very situa it's very situational. For me, I emailed the Disability Services Department of Sarah Lawrence uh, and like three months before I started school. Uh, I'm in a master's program now at CUNY uh, getting uh, for disability studies and I emailed, SPS. yeah, Sorry. SPS, yeah, <laughs> um, at CUNY SPS School of Professional Studies. Um, and I emailed the Director of Disability Services like two months ahead of time. I'll email professors ahead of time but when it comes to something like a job interview where I'm not paying them to teach me, I will make myself seem very credible. First, show what I'm capable of, and then at the end, sort of as like an additional thing, not as like a, and now I have this terrible news to tell you, but as just lighthearted, like, oh, also, I have this disability. Here's how it impacts me. I'll let you know if I need anything, and I have a different perspective, and that's great. And that, like, it's throwing it in later, so it's really situational. Thank you for all three of you. Um, <laughs> actually, we have this additional question that's kind of on the same topic that I just wanted to kind of pose as a follow-up. It says, what advice do you have for the student who is on campus but feels uncomfortable disclosing their disability? We've talked about everything you can do, but what about when you're uncomfortable? Um, I would say one thing that you can do, um, it sort of is a similar experience, I think, if you have some, if you have a disability that isn't immediately noticeable, it's almost sort of similar to coming out to friends and family as LGBT, and there's a lot of dialogue within the disability community about the idea of coming out. Um, and I guess my suggestions for that is you know yourself best and start with the people who you feel most comfortable telling. Just because you've told one person about your disability doesn't mean that you're all of a sudden obligated to stand on the top of a building and yell it out for everyone to hear. Like, you can tell some people 
and never tell anyone else. Once you tell one person, it doesn't mean that, you're, that you've officially set the rest of the course for anything. Um, one second. Can I say? Crystal, can you please address the issue of confidentiality once that information is disclosed? So, depending on who you're speaking with, um, within the Office of Accessibility Services, um, we are not allowed to speak to your faculty or anyone about your disability unless you provide us permission. Here at Gutman, what we do is we meet with the student and the faculty together with the agreement of the student to discuss their needs and how they could um, become more involved within the classroom. Um, to answer your question, um, I think going to the disability office and understanding what's the purpose of disabilities, uh, here at Gutman what we normally do is every um, Tuesdays and Thursdays is common hour and we have an event throughout the whole semester of what is accessibility, how can you self-advocate, uh, what is CUNY leads in terms with jobs, and um, if a person is not aware who to self-advocate, it's just to speak to someone within the office or attend, attend an event part of accessibility and then see if you're comfortable with that. Great, thank you. So kind of switching topics a little bit, this is about housing accommodations. Did any of you ever need them? How do you go about getting housing specific needs filled? So um, some CUNY schools have housing accommodations. Here at Gutman, we do not have um, housing accommodations. However, there is Res Life, where you can speak to the director there, where um, there's um, specialized rooms for students with disabilities. So um, I would say have a conversation with them or have someone from the disabilities office have a conversation on your behalf just to discuss the needs of housing. Um, and if this is housing within um, in an educational setting or housing looking for an apartment type accommodation? Um, probably with I would say educational. Education. Education. So um, most likely speak to the director and see in terms of what type of housing they have. Depending on your needs, some who require um, wheelchair access will use the first floor. Others may need to be in certain areas within the building. But um, if you're planning to be within housing, apply early. There is some limitations in terms of room space and where you could go. I can actually speak to this personally. Um, for me, it was definitely ahead of time, like up early. Um, that's how it worked best for me, just finding your voice and re reaching out early and really being honest about what you need. So our next question is, uh, how are we doing on time? We're great. We're good. Okay. Um, this question is just a general question for you all, whoever wants to answer. What do you think about having a universal disability organization that stands up for students with disabilities in higher education and their rights? What can we do about it? So within CUNY, we have CCSD. Um, please correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm saying the, the name incorrectly, it's Cal, um, CUNY Council with Students with Disabilities. Coalition. Uh, oh, Coalition, I'm so sorry. Um, Lewis attends our meeting on behalf of Lewis Stendup, who is also the student with I got men, um, if I'm saying your name incorrectly, R Regin, he's part of CCSD. Um, Barbara um, Bookman also attends CCSD meetings and their events. They are extremely amazing in self-advocacy. They recently went to Albany to promote additional funding within, um, within CUNY and SUNY campuses. They promote in terms of equal access around CUNY. They are extremely helpful to our community. Um, outside of the outside of CUNY, I think CUNY provides a really great model for how that can be done because there are so many schools with in so many locations that have so many different needs. Um, so, like having representatives from each 
different type of school I think is really important and I'm like I know I'm personally I'm thinking about it now how that could work when you have so many different types of schools and yeah I guess starting from even if you just started if it wasn't national to begin with even if it was just like statewide reaching out to your local schools and going out from there maybe that could help in having like a if it's not one council altogether, it could be like a meeting of student representatives from a number of different councils together once a year, twice a year, anything like that. And I feel like that could be really useful. It's a really good idea and hopefully we will have that sometime. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I just wanna add that you guys are all from different schools, so talk to each other. That's definitely a way to, you know, get the schools connected, share things that are going on in one school, different school, that sort of thing. Um, this next question, what does the Office of Disabilities do to train each professor? Because not all of them are as good at following the rules and regulations as others. Wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> I could speak in two um, schools. Um, I came from John Jay College. I was also the assistant director here, over there, and then the director here at Gutman Community College. So um, we do a number of things. Um, the first thing is attend onboarding where new faculty attend like a mini orientation and make sure that they understand the diverse population that we have here at Gutman. Um, we are also creating an online service where it's a Similar to Blackboard, I'm not sure if everyone knows what Blackboard is, but similar to Blackboard where you go through slides and, and you look at these scenarios and, and so on and so forth, and at the end it's a mini questionnaire, I can't say exam. Um, <laughs> and what we do is here at Gutman, we attend instructional team meetings. So each person within my team, they are in charge of an instructional team meeting and a cohort where we go into this meeting and we train faculty and staff, we educate them in terms of how students would need accommodations inside or off campus. Uh, we use the model of universal design within um, the instructional team meetings. We also have one-on-one -on -one meetings with our faculty. Um, we, we allow them to come into our own orientation here at Gutman just to meet the first year students as well. So we do a lot of collaborative efforts within faculty and staff here. Okay, great, thank you. It's great to get that perspective. We can also ask some more when we're in the small groups about that more specifically. Um, the next question is for Brylin. What made deciding to leave the dance world so well, you kind of touched on this before, mm -hmm. but you decided to change what you were doing and you kind of switched career paths. What advice do you have with students who are worried about not knowing what they want to do or maybe think that they're not studying exactly what they want to do? What, what, what advice could you give? Oh my, this <laughs> haunted me for months and months and months. Um, it was a process to try to like say, it's okay, Brylin, you spent all this time doing one thing and now it's you're just going to say goodbye to that and embark on a new journey, and that's okay. It still, like, makes me nervous to think about how difficult that was for me because I was, like, 100%. Like, I didn't even want to go to college. I wanted to go straight into a ballet company. I was obsessed, ultimately, like, so obsessed. So, and to not, now to not even be dancing anymore, and I'm honestly happier than I've ever been. I'm free of, like, all of that stress and comparison, all of these unhealthy habits that you can develop when you're a dancer. But if you are worried about that you're studying the wrong thing or you don't know where what you're studying is going to take you, don't worry about that just yet. Um, you can learn a lot with each step of the way in college. You can learn learning what you hate and what you do not want to do. Check that box off. Like that is a step that you can take thinking, okay, I definitely don't like this math class and I definitely don't like this journalism class, so that kind of going into that career is probably not the best idea. You don't want to close any doors, but you don't have to just lay awake at night during college and just tremble and wonder, like, what am I doing the right thing? 
because there's hope. You can go through a four-year degree and, and change your mind. You don't have to put all of this pressure on yourself. I felt like, for me at Fordham, I put so much pressure on myself to keep dancing that it kept me from other opportunities, joining other clubs, um, student government, all of these things that I'm actually very interested in now. I always have some regrets because I didn't take advantage of them when I was at Fordham at this large scale where there, there were gigantic club fairs. I walked right past them and I have a lot of regret about that, but it's okay because I'm taking advantage of it now. So my point is that you can start over any time that you want and it's just about, about like figuring out what you do want to do and not rushing that process because life is filled with ups and downs and twists and turns and you just kind of have to, this is like kind of cliche, but you just have to continue going with the flow of your, like in going with your journey. Everybody has a different journey. Don't compare yourself to others because nobody is going through exactly what you are going through. Um, and so, yeah, don't really worry about it. Just do the best that you can in your classes. And if you're really passionate about a certain thing right now, dive fully into that 100%, um, coming at it from different angles. Like, like I'm going to talk about in small groups with extracurriculars, you can do so much in one semester coming at your interests from different angles, uh, different clubs, and that is just really helpful. And yeah, just getting involved as much as possible helps you figure out what you do and do not want to do in the future. And so the reason I started over was because I didn't do that really in undergrad. I just had one focus. I had my eye on dance. And then, and then I started over. But if you can try to like figure it out before, that, that's always good. But again, just don't stress about it and do well in school and do as much as you can. Thank you. A little applause for that. <laughs> um, we have another question that actually it might be better for the small group sessions, but um, for those, it's about um, it's for Rebecca, and it's it's about advertising about disability programs, and I guess also finding out about disability programs at your school. The question is, how can you advertise that your college has deaf programs? Many of us are unknown to your programs nowadays. Sure. Could you say the how can you advertise that your program has deaf programs? Deaf programs. I would imagine it's any program. Sure. Um, so. One thing that I found useful as running a disability, I can't speak to um, a deaf program to the best of my knowledge. Unfortunately, Sarah Lawrence does not have one. Um, but for disability, one thing I found really useful and that I tried to do as much as I could was collaborate with unrelated student groups. So I had an event that I was collaborating with the group that showed films on campus every week. That meant that people who maybe don't want to, who wouldn't look up the word disability or in a career fair find, uh, seek out disability, they found out because we had a screening of Finding Dory and then discussed positive disability representation. And that was fun and it brought people in who maybe didn't know that they might have some interest in disability and in being an ally or in self-advocating for themselves as someone with a disability. Um, and then the other thing, and this is very cliche and sounds silly, but I'm being deadly serious. Students go to things with free food. If you say there's free food, you'll get students. Um, if, if it's chocolate-based food, you'll get more students. Um, and, and just having things that are, of course, serious events are important, and we had a lot of serious events. We had protests. We had memorials. But also mixing that in with fun events that people would want to go to even if they have no interest in disability. So we had a fidget making workshop where we were all making like glitter jars and stuff and that was to talk about neurodiversity and autism acceptance as compared to awareness. Uh, but also people came because there was glitter and beads and like it was fun. I, it's not always as, that's my best advice is combination of collaborating with as many people as you can uh, and having fun events and bribing people with food. That sounds great. That sounds great. <laughs> Um, thank you for that, and I want to thank you all. Oh, did you have yeah, something? Yeah, I just wanted to add in terms to add? of the depth, um, event. Oh, yeah. So um, here at Gutman, what we do is um, we have an RSVP 
um, links that we send out for our events and students who required accommodations, we ask them to come to our office and indicate what event they would like to attend to so we can make sure that the accommodations are there. So if we have a deaf or hard of hearing student or who require um, sign language interpreters to give us enough time to, in order to request one. If we have students who have visual impairments who require enlarged tests, um, come to our office and we will do those materials for you. Okay. Thank you, Crystal, for adding that. Um, I want to thank you all. Let's give our wonderful panelists a round of applause. This was informative and fabulous. Thank you to each of you. Um, you will get to talk to them some more a little bit later, but for now, I'm going to hand the mic over to Debbie, who will be the MC for the rest of the day. Wow, let's give one more round of applause. You guys are amazing. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, thank you to all our participants here today and to all those who joined us via webinar. Um, this is where the webinar ends and we part ways with those virtual participants. Um, while we work our magic here and turn off all video coverage, such that our participants feel safe to share and grow. Uh, thank you for joining us. And um, we want to hear feedback. You don't have to shut it off just yet, Um We want to hear feedback from, okay, from Arizona and Utah on your shared group experience during this webinar. And I know that Arizona, your great professor, is going to be doing a lot of the activities that we're doing here, and you'll be doing there. So um, let us know how it goes. And again, you guys, you women, were fabulous. And we really look forward to the, to the interactive component that is waiting. So let's say farewell to our webinar friends. Bye. 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 <laughs>